<laughs> They're asking me where my papers are. My papers are all in my mind. Your mom. Uh oh. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. I just want to speak this morning on planting seeds. Amen. And the Bible verse that I'm going to refer to is Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. Amen. When I was taping, taking our Bible courses, I was taking them thinking that uh, I wanted to do counseling. And I went to a few weddings, I had been to a few funerals, and I saw that there was no seeds being planted. They were out there talking about the funeral, but they weren't saying anything about God and how we get to God and how we go to God. And when we die, what it takes to get to be with God. So uh, I kind of started changing my mind. I went to one of my friend's funeral and uh, I said, it really bothered me because it was a real boring service mm -hmm. and it wasn't personable and even though you don't know the person you can still make it kind of personable yes so i decided well you know what god i think that's what i need to do not what i want to do but it was a need at that point because i said there's too many going that weren't getting fed mm -hmm. so um i decided that i'm going to make myself available and all we have to do is let God ask God and he will allow it to happen. Yes, yes, yes. So just this past year, I've done four weddings wow. and four funerals. Amen. Wow. You know, uh, and uh, everyone, even though it may not have been a Christian wedding or a Christian funeral, they got it. That's right. Amen. So, you know, all we have to do is make ourselves available yes. and God will use us. Yes. He will equip us. And if we have difficulties, all you have to do is go to your pastors and say, what could I do differently or what should I do? Or, and so I would, with, with Pastor David, I had been at quite a few funerals, so I would just take keep notes of them and take a little bits and personalize them. Mm -hmm. Yesterday I did a funeral for a lady, well, a friend of my dad, he was saying that they were just going to bury her and they weren't going to have a service or anything. And it was really upsetting to him. But he says, I don't know anybody. I don't, we don't attend church or. So my dad says, well, my daughter does this. He says, your daughter does this? My dad says, yeah. He goes, she's taking her courses and she does this. What do you think she'd be interested? My dad says, well, give her a call. So he gave me a call and I said, I'll be glad. So yesterday when I was doing the service, you know, I explained to him, I said, you know, after I did finish, complete the service, I said, this was a blessing to me. I grew up with your two sons in school. I said, I used to go to your home as an adult working for my dad. The wife was working for her husband. And we had a contact a lot because he was in construction. We were doing in construction. So we talked a lot. A few years ago when she came down with Alzheimer's, I saw her and I was speaking with her and I could tell she didn't really know me, but after she looked at me, she said, ah, oh, Sissy Hardy. I'm like, that's right. Mm -hmm. And then I got to do her going home service. Mm -hmm. You know, for a lot of people, they think, oh, the funeral is not something nice to go and do. As I'm doing more and more, it's such a blessing yes. to do a going home service and to have them come up to you after and say, thank you so much. It was a beautiful service. Uh, my wife really would have appreciated it or my husband or my mm -hmm. children. I did one this August. My sister was working and this lady had lost her mom at 52 years old. Wow. And she was crying to my sister. She said, I don't know what I'm going to do. My sister's like, what do you mean? I can't afford to have a service at a, at a home. We don't have the money. My mom's 52. I'm 20 something. What do I do? And my sister says, well, just have a, a graveside service. Well, I can't do that. We don't have any money. My sister says, wait a minute, I'll make a call. So my sister called me and said, would you be willing to do it free of cost? I said, well, of course I will. Of course. I'm doing God's work. That's right. To tell you that we are to go to plant seeds. Yes. We're not there to go and judge. That's right. Because if I would have judged, I could have judged the whole service long. Yeah. I got there. These 19-year-old kids were cursing and looking at me to see if they were going to get a reaction out of me. Mm -hmm. I just turned my back and was just talking with another person. I did the service. After their service, they came right beside me and lit up a joint, thinking they were going to get something oh, no out of me way. again. So I just 
didn't bother with it. People yeah. would come up and said, thank you so much for the service. It was beautiful. We have to remember when we go out into the world mm -hmm. to make disciples of all the nations, we are going as a representative That's right. of God. All right. So Amen. if I would have reacted, they would have said, what kind of a woman of God is she? Yes, exactly. So I told my husband on my tombstone, as all of us should, I want a lighthouse with a beacon of light shining out because we are all beacons of light. Yes. And that is what we are called to do. So go out and plant a seed. Amen. Thank you. The reading today from the Lord is the Amplified Version, and it's Romans chapter 6. What shall we say to all this? Should we continue in sin and practice sin as a habit so that God's gift of grace may increase and overflow? Certainly not. How can we, the very ones who died to sin, continue to live in any longer? Or are you in immigrant of the fact that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We have therefore been buried with him through baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory and power of the Father, we too might walk happily in new, newness of life, yes. abandoning our old ways. For if we have become one with him permanently united in the likeness of his death, we will also certainly be one with him and share fully in yes. the likeness of his resurrection. Yes. yes. We know that our old self, our human nature, without the Holy Spirit, was nailed to the cross mm. with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we no longer be slaves to sin. Yes. For the person who has died with Christ has been freed <clears throat> from the power of sin. Yes. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live together with him. Amen. Because we know the self-evident truth that Christ from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has power over him. Hallelujah. For death has for the death that he died, he died to sin ending. His power and pain the sinner's debt. Once and for all, yes. and the life that he lives, he lives to glorify God in unbroken fellowship with him. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin and your relationship to it broken, but alive to God in unbroken fellowship with him in Christ Jesus. Yes. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body mm. so that you obey its lust and passions. Mm. Do not go on offering members of your body to sin as is instruments of wickedness, but offer yourselves to God in a decision act as those alive raised from the dead to a new life and your members, all of your abilities sacri <coughs> sacrifice set apart as instruments of righteousness mm. yielded to God. Yeah. <clears throat> For sin will no longer be a master over you, no. since you are not under law as slaves, but under un unmerited grace yes. as recipients of God's favor mm. and mercy. Yes. When then are we to conclude? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under God's grace? Right. Certainly, Certainly not. No. Do you not know that when you continually offer yourself to someone to do this, his will, you are the slaves Slave. of the one whom you obey, mm. either slaves of sin, which leads to death, mm -hmm. or, of, or obedience, which leads to righteousness, right standing with God. Mm -hmm. 
But thank God that though you were slaves to sin, you became obedient with all your heart to the standard of teaching in which you were instructed and to which you were committed. Yes. And having been set free from sin, you have become the slaves of righteousness for conformity to God's will and purpose. Mm -hmm. I am speaking in familiar human terms because of your natural limitations, your spiritual immaturity. For just as you presented your body members as slaves to impurity and to moral lawlessness, leading to further lawlessness. So now offer your members, your abilities, your talents as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification that is being set apart for God's purpose. Yes. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. You had no desire to conform to God's will. Mm. So what benefit did you get at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? ashamed. None. Mm. For the outcome of those things is death. Yes. Mm. But now since you have been set free from sin and have becoming willingly slaves to God, you have your benefit resulting in sanctification, being made holy and set apart for God's purpose. And the outcome of this is eternal life. Amen. For the wages of sin is death, Amen. but the free gift of God, that <clears throat> is his remarkable, overwhelming <clears throat> gift of grace yes. to believers, it's eternal life in Christ <clears throat> Jesus our Lord. Amen. 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 First time in camera again. Yes. Amen. So here, as she turns her video on, praise the Lord, is Evangelist Deborah A. Weston out of New York, Brooklyn. Amen. God bless you. There's her beautiful uh, background. Amen. Let's hear what God has placed upon her heart today. We don't see you, Evangelist. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. She, she's going to be seen. I have to. I have to. I, I have to put her up. Okay. Well, you put her up then. You go ahead. We want to look at her. We don't want to look at you. Praise the Lord, Sister Hope. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, how's everyone this morning? Amen. Bless. Bless. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. We serve an amazing God. Yes, we is. have we, we serve a God that has a sense of humor. <laughs> yeah. We serve a God that is loving. We serve a God that is patient, even in the midst of our disobedience. Mm -hmm. So the title of my message this morning is Consequences of Disobedience to God. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, <laughs> okay, stop making me laugh. Okay. <laughs> um, in the reading, the title says, Believers are dead to sin, alive to God. Amen. And once again, God was talking to your sister because mm. I was going through something. Uh huh. And I was making a choice or wanting to make a choice of being disobedient to God, which is it's stupid, really, because <laughs> he's God. Yes. But in any event, as followers of Jesus, can y'all still see me? Yes. 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 No more. Okay. <laughs> hey. Hey. Stop playing with your mouth. It's not me. It's when we speak in the house, it shows. Oh, okay. oh. Um, really? You can see me. Yes. Because oh, I can't see myself. All right. As followers of Jesus, the Christ, the Holy Spirit lives within us. And he is our advocate, our comforter, our guide, and teacher. However, if we make a choice, and you're going to hear me say that terminology, make a choice. We need to remember that God is not a dictator. 
and he allows us free will. So once again, how if we make a choice to ignore his divine leadership and insist on doing things our way, Lord will let us face the consequences until we finally repent and turn back to him. When we make a choice to refuse to listen to God and decide to go our own way, we can expect the following consequences. The first one is the consequence of confusion. The Tower of Babel in Genesis 11 is a good example of how when we try and do things our own way, God will cause confusion to set in when he is not approving of our decisions. Now, the irony of this is back in Genesis 9, these are descendants of Noah, who God called a righteous man. He had blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Okay, this sounds choppy on my end. It's okay, Evangelist. Okay, all right. Clearly, they were being disobedient in Genesis 11 because God is telling them, I need you to go out and scatter across the earth and multiply. But they thought they knew better. So not only did God put out what I like to call a biblical cease and desist on this tower, he still accomplished his will despite them. They were still scattered over the face of the earth. 1 Corinthians 14.33 in the King James Version says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. So that's just a reminder that when we think we know better than God, he shows us that he is all-knowing, that he can put a monkey wrench in any decision that we try to make without his approval. The next consequence is conflict. And I can relate to this one personally right now. We'll experience internal conflict when the Holy Spirit gives us an uneasiness, inadequacy, and doubt over our wrong choices and decisions. We must understand we cannot fight God and expect to win. We're talking about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, a triple threat. An example that came to my mind, I was doing this, is like, I'm only five foot two. And I don't know how tall Bishop David is, but just imagine me walking up to him, saying, come on, come on, put him up, put him up. He could just take his hand and bop me in the top of my head and it's all over. That's how it looks when we think we're going to fight God. We can't. Ephesians 4, 30 to 32 in the Amplified says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, but seek to please him, by whom you were sealed and marked, branded as God's own. For the day of redemption, the final deliverance from the consequences of sin, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, perpetual animosity, resentment, strife, fault finding, and slander be put away from you along with every kind of malice, all spitefulness, verbal abuse, malevolence, be kind and helpful to one another, tenderhearted, compassionate, understanding, forgiving one another readily and freely, just as God in Christ also forgave you. I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one that has experienced these emotions when someone has offended us, insulted us, or just made us feel uncomfortable that we would rather retaliate in the carnal instead of letting the Holy Spirit lead us and guide us and showing us how we are still to love those who offend us. The next, hmm. the next consequence is cost. Disobedience is always costly when we don't do the right thing in the right time and in the right way, according to the will of God. Second Corinthians 13, five in the NLT says, 
Examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. The next consequence is loss. And Bishop David spoke something about this last week in his service. So disobedience will cause us to experience some type of loss in our lives, whether it be spiritual, which is our connection with God, whether it's emotionally, which means we allow our feelings instead of the Holy Spirit to dictate our behavior, or we have a physical loss when we are more focused on material possessions instead of our salvation. Philippians 3, 8 to 9, and the King New King James Version says, Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Another consequence of our disobedience is regret. God chooses the best direction, time, and way for us. Therefore, if we go in an opposite direction, we don't wait for his timing or we do it our way, we will miss his best and suffer deep regret. The same type of regret I believe that David felt in Psalm 51, where he says, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. We need to understand that when we're disobedient to God, we are in sin. It's a heart issue. And it's a, a, a spirit of pride, basically, that's the root of it all. And that we can't hide from him. That we don't know better than him. The next consequence is discipline. When you make a choice not to listen to God or obey him, he will discipline us. He disciplines us to expose our sin, giving us the choice to confess, repent, and share in his holiness. Proverbs 3, 11 to 12 in the NLT says, my child, don't reject the Lord's discipline and don't be upset when he corrects you. For the Lord corrects those he loves just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. The same way those of us who have children or have been guardians over children, our sole purpose is for their best interest. And that's just how God is over us as his children. He knows what's better. And all we have to do is listen. But we all know that's not always the case. Because even with our earthbound parents, I know a lot of us did not listen. God's desire is that we learn to trust him completely and totally. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. We need to understand that disobedience to God is critical to our salvation. God is never pleased with those of us who are disobedient or full of pride. This is what Samuel says to Saul because of his disobedience and pride, which caused Saul to be rejected as king. In 1 Samuel 15, 23, he says, rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. So because you have rejected the command of the law, he has rejected you as king. We also need to understand and remember that the heart is deceitful. God tells us in Jeremiah 17, 9 to 10, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I give all people their due rewards 
according to what their actions deserve. Selfishness, disobedience, and pride can cause us to rebel against God and will take away our usefulness in God's kingdom work. God can't use an instrument that is not willing to be obedient to him. Because when you do, you're telling him that you know better. So he can't work with you. I'm going to offer you two ways. As I stated, this is a heart issue. It's a pride issue. Two ways on how we can work on getting our hearts right so that we're not disobedient to God is ask God to search your heart. Psalm 139, 23 to 24 says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. I just want people to understand that you are going to get angry. And like I said, this is once again a personal message for me. That God is there with you. And as he said, you have to pray for those who persecute you. And I know sometimes it's hard. But I also need you to understand that when you're having these feelings, you need to acknowledge them. Don't hold them in. You need to confess them to God. And if there's someone that you can speak to, you need to also confess them to them. Because the devil loves nothing more than for us to keep things secretive or to draw back and and seclude ourselves from everyone. And that's when he starts filling us with the chatters of lies, um, feeding on our insecurities, feeding on our fears, um, making things, mountains out of molehills, things that don't even exist. But because we have secluded ourselves, he can just play. He has a playground in our minds and he fills it with lies. So just remember that. Number two, ask God to change your heart. Psalm 51.10 in the God's translation says, create a clean heart in me, O God, and renew a faithful spirit within me. We need to understand, and I'll be closing, that today I want you to understand that the message is not that you have to get your heart right so that you can come to God, but the message is come to Jesus the Christ in order to have a new heart. I love you. And to God be the glory. Somewhere along the line, that message is for us. Read over Romans 6 again. Go through what the evangelist has said. You know, one of the things, Bethel, that we have come to understand, message doesn't have to be long. It does not. The message just has to be direct. And here's uh, our pastor, Apostle Mel, coming to wrap it up. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. No wrap up. Yay! <laughs> I'm so serious. Um, You know, if we listen with an open heart and open ears to what Sister Hope read this morning in the scripture, and I pray that you take the opportunity to go and read Romans 6. The message is Mm self-explanatory. As the evangelist said, she was speaking from a personal vantage point, and I believe if we all read that word, we can speak from a personal vantage point, too. We are to disobedience. I don't care how much you love the Lord. We all love him. But we are prone to disobedience because we still exist in this flesh, in this realm. Amen. And we know that disobedience leads to, first of all, it breaks the heart of God. Yes. If we love God, we don't want to do that. As a child, I never wanted to do anything and break my parents' hearts. Yes. My dad is still alive. I don't want to do anything to disappoint my father. And I still don't want to do anything to disappoint my father in heaven. I need the person who is talking to stop it right now. Because it's 
this is a random. This is just blatant disobedience. It's like every week. Why do we have to keep saying, as long as we are in service, please limit your conversation. If you must talk, hang up or put your mic on mute. You guys are not children. Even the kids understand to be quiet in service. We're not just here just random because we don't have anything to do on Sunday morning. We come to receive from the Lord. And you can't be receiving if you're talking to. Now, I'm done with it. What a word, but it's not a word to be in because you're going to say what you're against and everything. Yeah. 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 Wow. I didn't hear that, and it's a good reason why I didn't hear it because I would probably have a response. But in any event, disobedience leads to consequences. The evangelist said that the word tells us that it will lead to confusion. It will lead to conflict. We are not to grieve the spirit. It is costly. We suffer loss. We have regrets. Discipline we will receive will expose our sin. And the way to fix that is to ask God. Ask God to reveal to us what needs to be done so that we can walk upright before him. There is blessedness and walking upright before the Lord. If you if you don't do that, it is because you're listening to a deceitful heart, a heart who wants to lead you into selfishness and disobedience and pride. And so I will end by saying, ask the Lord to search you. And when God shows you what is going on with you that is not right or does not align up with his word, in all earnest, go to the Lord and ask for forgiveness. One thing is you can't fool God. Amen. You can lie to me. You can lie to the pastor, and you can lie to, <clears throat> to people. On yourself. But God, and we certainly lie to ourselves all the time when we say we're so holy and righteous and we don't walk. And I want you to know that people know when you're not walking in it. You're not fooling anybody. And so it, it is evangelist and I had a long conversation yesterday just dealing with how we have to be real with ourselves. Yeah. You know, it's not about other people. It's about God exposing us to us. Because if God exposes us to us and gives us an opportunity with the help of the Holy Spirit to work through it, we don't have to worry about other people exposing us at times when you don't want to be exposed. Amen. And so with that, I'm going to shut my face. Um, I pray that no one was offended, but as a parent, sometimes to be to discipline, we heard that. And so when you're not doing what you should be doing, expect to be disciplined and you can like it or lump it, as they say, you know, because if it's not here, it'll be somebody else. If, if a person cares about you and they know you're not doing right, they will discipline. You. It's when they don't care that they just let you do whatever you want to do. And this is that's why here on Earth, the body of Christ serves as a family. God sets us in place so that we can watch over one another. I can't see you doing wrong and don't say something. How can I love you if I know you're going on the wrong path and I don't say anything? I don't love you. I don't care. You know, so I love each and every one of you. So when I speak, sometimes maybe a little sharp because I don't have a filter on it because I know when it's time for me to get disciplined, I have to take my discipline. I can't cry to anybody about it because it is a consequence of me being disobedient. Amen. So you got to take it. If you can dish it out, then you need to be able to take it. Mm -hmm. Amen. God bless you. Will you please stay. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, May ma I say something? Yes, please. Just, just hold on. Let me take the tape off. Okay. <clears throat>